Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's February 24th, 2021, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. Today we're taking a look at the growing movement to restore degraded ecosystems around the globe. Ecological restoration refers to human activities that promote the recovery of ecosystems that have been so disturbed that their structure has been altered and their healthy functioning impaired. Researchers are increasingly warning that human actions have so depleted the natural world that the ability of Earth's ecosystems to sustain future generations is far from guaranteed. The need to restore degraded ecosystems has become so urgent, in fact, that the decade of 2021 to 2030 has been declared the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which the UN says is a rallying call to ramp up efforts to protect and revive ecosystems worldwide. Only with healthy ecosystems can we enhance people's livelihoods, counteract climate change, and stop the collapse of biodiversity, the UN notes. We're joined on the podcast today by author Judith Schwartz, whose 2020 book, The Reindeer Chronicles, and other inspiring stories of working with nature to heal the earth, documents the global movement focused on ecological rehabilitation. Schwartz shares with us some examples of the inspiring restoration projects from around the world that she features in the book how an ecosystem's ability to handle the flow of solar energy is a measure of its health, and what gives her hope that we can build a sustainable future. Dealing with climate change asks us to get our hands in the dirt, asks us to engage with communities, to really do the work of healing our landscapes. We're also joined by Taro Mistonen, president of an NGO called the Snow Change Cooperative. Mastonen tells us about Snow Change's Landscape Rewilding Program, which aims to rewild Arctic and boreal habitats using both traditional indigenous knowledge and science. He also tells us why this approach, combining indigenous knowledge and science, is such a powerful means of restoring ecosystems and gives us a more ground-level view of ecological restoration by telling us about the program's efforts to rewild the Koitayoki River Basin in Finland. If we can export and extrapolate this model, for example, in the continental U.S., across Europe, across large areas that are currently single soil or monoculture habitats for one single purpose, we might have a fighting chance. That's the most exciting part. We live in an age of a global climate crisis, a global biodiversity crisis, and a global water crisis. All of these converging crises are the result of human activities that are, in most cases, still ongoing. So it may be all too easy to suffer from an acute environmental despair these days, but that's not at all the tact that Judith Schwartz takes in her book, The Reindeer Chronicles. There's a sense of optimism laced throughout the book as she writes about the people who are, quote, doing the essential work of restoring land and ensuring that the green-blue orb we sail on remains fit for habitation. Her optimism is fitting to the book's subject matter. Earth repair is a participatory sport, Schwartz writes, a grassroots response to evolving global crises. It is the inverse of apathy and an antidote to despair. Reading the Reindeer Chronicles, you can't help but share in Schwartz's hope and wonder about the potential for our planet to heal itself and the global people-powered movement to promote Earth's capacity for healing. What inspires me to write is often what I feel is missing from the conversation and Over the last several years, I've been encountering these extraordinary stories of earth healing that just hasn't made its way to the media just or to public consciousness. And I felt it was so important because all we get is bad news. And it's important to understand that there are these efforts that are succeeding for many reasons. One is for our spirit because you know, who can survive on a constant diet of negativity? It's really, really hard. Also, because each of these initiatives give us more knowledge, it kind of is creating a bank of tools and understanding that we can apply elsewhere. So Even if we've got a project happening on one side of the world, it still may offer insights into the same ecological principles that we can apply wherever we are. Another reason Schwartz says she felt compelled to share these stories of successful restoration. Just to invite people into the process. So I think it's really important. So, And I think this does actually relate to the to the nature of news and how we've kind of been 
living is that here we are, we're concerned about the environment, we're concerned about the well-being of animals, our fellow humans, etc. But we're kind of being bombarded with all this bad news of how of rising CO2 levels, of weather extremes, etc. And it leaves us feeling very disempowered. And that disempowerment is really undermining our capacity to do the work of healing the world. So while we've kind of been trained to assume that solving large problems is the job of experts, you know, like the people who are qualified that have degrees listed after their names that have, that are associated with entities that are empowered, empowered to do this work. I think it's important to understand that earth healing is really a participatory sport and that we can start right where we are. And one of the main reasons that I felt compelled to tell these stories, I guess I've given you a few reasons already, but why I think it is so important is that in talking about climate and dealing with climate change, what has been missing from the discussion is the role, if not the centrality, of functioning ecosystems in climate regulation. So here we are looking at the Keeling curve go up, up, up. The Keeling curve is a graph of daily global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations maintained by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. And we feel utterly helpless and despondent. But where does that leave us? We can certainly work on policy to reduce greenhouse gases, etc. We can protest against oil companies, and certainly all of that is really meaningful. But it's as though we've been talking about addressing the the problem of climate change, that we can do so without touching anything. But I strongly believe that dealing with climate change asks us to get our hands in the dirt, asks us to engage with communities, to really do the work of healing our landscapes, because that's where we are, and because that is essential to supporting nature's climate regulation capacity. And that will build climate resilience. We're all called on to make lifestyle changes and to take other actions to help combat climate change all the time. But I didn't actually realize that there was this grassroots restoration movement you write about going on around the world. Can you talk about your encounters with that movement? I think it's been going on a long time and that people have been doing projects and communities have been working to reforest. But what's happening now is that there's more communication among these groups. And also, um, it's a situation where often the people who are out there doing the work are not communicating about it because they're busy doing the work. So networks have been developing where people are sharing their understanding. And for example, there's the ecosystem restoration camp movement, which is really, really very new. So I went to Camp Altiplano in Spain in the fall of 2018. And at that point, that was the first ecosystem restoration camp. And at, at that point, it was one of only two. Now there are 37 camps in many countries, including several in the U.S., And they each have their own flavor. They each have their own kind of approach and goal and spirit. So as an example, there's a camp, one of the earlier ones that that kind of came into being soon after 2018, soon after when I was in Spain, is Camp Paradise in California. And that is in the region that suffered from those horrible, horrible fires when it was not only the wildfire, but the interaction with the the grid of the electrical circuits that were not 
built to withstand such ecological pressure. So this is a disaster response ecosystem restoration camp. So they are developing ways and a kind of bank of knowledge of how to deal with and respond to and recover from large wildfires. So that's that's really kind of an interesting response, again, rather than waiting for the experts who may not get to this landscape for a long time because, you know, government entities are are backed up and everyone's looking for funds for for disaster recovery. They are building an understanding of how to do so within that community and inviting other people from communities that face similar challenges to learn alongside with them. So so that is one example about of how this plays out. I think this is another really powerful idea that I was struck by in your book. The idea that we have been conditioned to think that things like climate change and biodiversity loss are problems that are so large that only experts can solve them, perhaps through some moonshot technological fix. But as you document in the book, there are people all over the world who aren't waiting around for experts to tell them what to do. And restoration is a solution that we can all get our hands dirty with right now. Yeah. Well, I think with in terms of climate, I think we can start to ask ourselves some very basic questions, such as how does the earth manage heat? And we can then understand that the earth has been regulated for billions of years. The climate and temperature has been regulated largely from water-based processes. And then when you take that one step further, you can look at ways to work with the water cycle to promote nature's basic cooling methods. There's a there's a quote that I love from a from a farmer, author, kind of maverick ecologist in Australia named Peter Andrews. And he says that plants manage water and in managing water, they are managing heat. And I think that is so, so powerful to understand how our ecosystems, how the communities of plants and animals in the landscapes that surround us are managing heat, are creating the climate, are creating the conditions for rainfall. So when you when you think about it, and you know, what once you I guess this is the the thing that you know, it took me a while and a lot of exploration to feel confident to kind of remove myself from the passive position of, well, the experts know everything and they frame the the discussion and I can be most effective by working within that frame to shifting to asking questions and looking for an understanding and a framing of our challenges that makes sense to me. So in a sense, the story of climate is the story of what happens when solar radiation meets the ground, meets the surface of the earth. Because what happens determines whether that solar radiation, that heat, that energy is incorporated into life forms to create more conditions for more life and ecological abundance, or whether that solar radiation strikes either bare soil or a parking lot or any bare or concrete, any bare surface. Because when it strikes a bare surface with no life, that solar radiation becomes sensible heat. So looking at it from that perspective, we have tremendous agency. And if we can understand that the story of climate is not just held on a graph or um, in, a, on a, in a set of, of computer models, but rather the story of climate is happening everywhere we look whenever the sun is beaming down. I mean, I'm looking outside, actually. There's not much of a sun beaming down right now because we have snow flurries and it's really cloudy. But 
it's all happening, you know, that moisture is moving. And when moisture is moving, it is transferring heat. So it's a matter of, of looking and, and, and seeing how, how it all works. Yeah, you write about this in the book. You write that climate change is best understood as the manifestations of disrupted carbon, water, nutrient, and energy cycles. Can you tell us a bit more about that and about some restoration projects that are seeking to redress these disruptions? When we're talking about uh, the solar radiation striking the Earth, that is the energy cycle. You know, we often think of energy as in the energy that we use, that that which fuels our cars and, you know, turns the lights on. But but this is the, the basic elemental energy. And then, of course, the carbon cycle. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the the rising levels of CO2. But I think it's really, really helpful if we can understand that it's a cycle that that carbon is always cycling and moving through life forms and that's actually when i started to get the aha that led me into this exploration of soil and water and ecological restoration because i understood and it kind of blew me away that carbon is not only about our human use of energy and the burning of fossil fuels but also the cycling of carbon between the soil and plants and the atmosphere and the ocean so that carbon can be drawn down into the soil. And a lot, the big problem of to having too much carbon in the atmosphere, a lot of that is due to our mistreatment of the soil. And then I also mentioned the water cycle, and then there's the nutrient cycle. And I think that's really also important. I mean, it's kind of a complicated thing. I mean, you know, that nutrients are always cycling through different life forms, just as, as water and carbon are, are cycling and energy is cycling. The thing about the nutrient cycle, I mentioned that because it's, it's, it's something that we haven't really looked at. And our activities have massively disrupted the nitrogen cycle in some ways more than we've disrupted the carbon cycle, because what we've done is rather than work with nature, the way nature cycles nitrogen, we create nitrogen-based fertilizer by kind of breaking the bonds through the Haber-Bosch process. And so we're taking nitrogen in the air and kind of fusing it together with other elements to create nitrogen that we can use. But that is not, I mean, that's really changed things so that we've got a lot of nitrous oxide, which is several hundred times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon. And then we've got nitrogen moving into our water supply, which is causing all sorts of problems, including dead zones and also harming drinking water, polluting water, you know, that otherwise would be clean and ecologically productive. So anyway, that's that's where the nutrient cycle fits in there. And they're all these cycles working together and they all move through the surface of the of the earth, which is that fine layer of soil that creates so much abundance that we all depend on. I mean, it creates our food, it, and it also, it holds water and is a platform for plants and animal life, holds biodiversity and supports biodiversity. All of the projects that I've been writing about and talking to the people who are doing them um, or implementing them they begin with the water cycle because if you have a degraded landscape, one of the most important steps you can take to restore that landscape is to collect water and ensure that you are keeping the water in that landscape, holding the water where it falls. 
And one of the most dramatic projects is the one that I write about in Saudi Arabia, and that is the Al Beta project that that permaculture designer Neil Spackman worked on and stewarded the ecological part of this broader project that was about poverty reduction among the Bedouin people in a Western Saudi Arabia community. And so we're talking about a landscape where it may go more than a year without any meaningful rainfall, where it is so hot that much of the year people will only do their ecological work at night. It's so hot that a lot of the pollination of plants occurs at night. So it's a really harsh landscape. But yet, Neil and his team of Bedouins were able to dramatically improve this 100-acre demonstration plot. And what they did was they realized that even though it doesn't rain often, when it does rain, it floods. So therefore, there's all this, this ample water that hadn't been used because it's just been flowing off in a, in a flood and ripping up even more of the, of, of the, the, the topsoil or whatever was left or the sandy soil. So what they did was in anticipation of the next rainfall, they created swales. A swale is a shallow channel used as an infiltration basin designed to trap water runoff so it can infiltrate the soil. And they used rocks to kind of steer the moisture, the, the rain, so that it, it is slowed down and it goes to where they wanted it to go, where the plants would be. And they kept building these small earthworks. And then when it rained, they rushed out and they planted. And they did this through many cycles. And as I said, often with more than a year between rainfalls. I mean, the kind of patience that this requires is way beyond me. <laughs> um, so so the, a few years went by and they did this and they planted and the landscape kept getting greener and more abundant. And Neil said that after a, a period of time, he saw that there were ants and there hadn't been any ants there. I mean, ants are something we just kind of always expect are around. But when the conditions improved, the ants showed up and there were more birds and there were more bats and there were, there was a greater variety of mushrooms. He said that after a rainfall, usually in the beginning, there had only been one type of mushroom that would just sort of appear. But then there were about five different kinds of mushrooms. So I mean, you know, compared to New England, where I, where I am, where we have, you know, hundreds of mushrooms that can show up at, in a season, this doesn't sound like much, but, but they were really improving the biodiversity. So, what, so they planted and they planted, the landscape got better. And then in 2016, they ran out of funds. So Neil's reaction was to shrug and say, well, I guess we can't do the the irrigation work that we had been doing, but the permaculture ideal is to create a self-sustaining ecological system. So let's see what we've been able to create here. Yeah, so what was the outcome of the project ultimately? All right, so that was in 2016. In 2019, he went back and took these photographs that make for the most wonderful before and after demos that you can possibly expect. And more to the point, 80% of the trees survived. So that is because they held on to the water, they made use of that water rather than losing it so that it just runs off 
creating erosion gullies and the like. But in doing so, they were able to build an ecological system by having microbes in the soil, uh, microbial life in the soil, and plants and grasses. And then the more grasses you have, the deeper the topsoil goes, the more microorganisms are being fed from the carbon that moves down through the roots of those plants. And the more biodiversity you have in the soil, the more biodiversity you can have above the soil, the more different plants you can have. And with the trees, the, the, the fungal networks that were manifested in the greater variety of mushrooms were extending the, the range of where plants could get their water from. So all of these positive feedbacks have resulted in a greatly restored ecosystem. So that's, that's one example. But I think it is worth noting that, I think, I, well, that, that water is a key here because you can't rebuild an ecosystem without keeping water in the landscape. In fact, one, uh, one other way that I have observed landscapes being restored is through holistic planned grazing, holistic management. And that is all about building the soil so that the soil is able to hold on to water. And one way that I think about it is in brittle landscapes. Now, one thing that Alan Savory, who has developed the holistic plan grazing model, one great contribution that he has offered, in, in my view, is an understanding of the brittleness scale. So here in New England, where I live, it is extremely non-brittle, meaning that, there, that we have moisture in the landscape evenly and precipitation evenly distributed throughout the year. But much of the world, in fact, most of the world, is, in, is more brittle, which means that there's a rainy season and a dry season. So nature, under these conditions, had a challenge, which was how to maintain moisture in the soil, which is a necessity to for plant and animal life to thrive, how do you maintain that moisture from the end of one rainy season to the beginning of the next? Otherwise, you'd have a just, you know, perennial plants couldn't survive. So the answer that nature came up with is through the behavior and digestive systems of ruminant animals. So those animals, like the cattle or in the Africa savanna, it could be, you know, wildebeest and kudu and all these other animals, they are kind of moving digesters and they are holding on to moisture and, mo and delivering that moisture through their waste on the landscape and creating the conditions for life to continue throughout the dormant season, throughout the, the dry season. So that's what I observed in, in many areas where they are using holistic plan grazing as a grassroots approach to restoring the ecosystems. And one example is the Africa Center for Holistic Management, which I visited in, oh my goodness, it was 2014 now but where I saw the work that they were doing at the center, as well as the work that they were doing in rural communities to help them apply holistic land grazing in their own lands, which I saw meant incredible, brought incredible benefits to the people who lived there, including many, many communities that are so far off the grid I mean, they, they're, they're really, you know, like miles down a dirt road from a main road. 
and are really struggling to find ways to maintain their livelihoods. You know, that's interesting because cattle ranching in particular is a pretty major environmental villain these days. But here you're saying it's actually being used to make sustainable livelihoods for remote communities. And and that's actually a point you make consistently throughout the book, that the tools we've used to destroy nature are also the tools we can use to restore nature. Absolutely. And in restoring them, we're following the pattern of evolution that nature has showed us. And the way one person that I interviewed extensively, John D. Liu, a... Uh, Chinese American filmmaker, he talks about how in evolution, evolutionary terms, nature was building biodiversity, building biomass, and building soil organic matter. And that's really the template for eco-restoration projects, is making sure that those trends, that those are the trends. Because once you take out any of them, whether it's biomass, you know, whether it's removing vegetation, whether it's destroying the soil, so removing the soil organic matter or removing biodiversity, then you can't, restoration can't happen. It will be blocked. You need those three. Well, your book has certainly made me more optimistic. What gives you hope that we can and will build a sustainable future? What makes you optimistic? What makes me optimistic is I'm seeing more conversations that are exploring and asserting the notion that we are part of nature as opposed to separate from nature. Because we, again, you know, hundreds of years of Western thought has been about people being separate from nature. And once you connect, you feel more connected with nature and and kind of cross that invisible psychic barrier then all these possibilities open up to you and the the logic of nature starts to reveal itself. And the love you have for your landscape will draw you to treat that landscape with respect. So so that's that's one thing. And yeah, I see more people involved in asking these kinds of questions, more people frustrated with an economy that is completely disconnected from what is actual wealth and more people raising the awareness that our legal system is designed to protect property and not nature, so um, private property. And another thing is that, that I've been following really closely is that we are about to enter, so that the United Nations has declared the next decade the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And so I'm excited about the chance for people to rally around this goal. I mean, for one thing, to even know that it's possible, because most people don't even know that it's possible, because as you say, we're only getting the bad news, which to me is a reflection of the nature of news, which is that if something is fine and functioning, it's not news. But if something goes wrong, it is news. So then our heads are filled with all this news <laughs> of what's going wrong. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about more people waking up to the possibility and the understanding that landscapes aren't static. You know, I think we tend to think of them as static, that we look around and whatever we see, we think it's always been that way, just because I think that's human nature. But to understand that that landscapes are always changing and that we can, that we have agency to help those our landscapes change in a positive, more healthy direction. And that we know will benefit all of us and our health, our water, our air, the biodiversity, and biodiversity sounds like just a kind of sciencey word, but no, we're talking about life. And, you know, I was kind of amused that people were, I know we're passing around some, a study that said that hearing more bird song is associated with greater happiness. And I just laughed because I thought, well, you know, with all due respects, did we really need to do a study on that? Because you know, I think that's something we intuitively know, and I think we intuitively respond to greater biodiversity, to more color, 
in our landscapes and, and more birds and more insects and butterflies. I mean, I think that's, that's just, you know, elemental. Now we'll hone in on restoration by talking to Taro Mastonen, the president of the Snow Change Cooperative, as well as a lead author for the forthcoming sixth assessment report of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Mustonen is not just a climate researcher, however, he's also a restoration practitioner through Snow Change's Landscape Rewilding Program, which is rewilding 24 sites in Finland using science informed by traditional knowledge of the local indigenous people. But what exactly does it mean to be rewilding these landscapes as opposed to restoring them? I think there are two issues that come to play here. One has to do with Finland, which is, of course, a Nordic country, but the uh, and it's located quite far up in the north with boreal ecosystems and then more tundra-like ecosystems up in the Arctic. So what's going on here is that since the last war, Second World War, a lot of those boreal ecosystems were converted into uh, timber and, and uh, peat mining production areas. I think it's actually the only country in the world where south of the Arctic Circle, over 90% of natural habitats were converted into timber and pulp production. So uh, what it implies is that the human influence on, on these ecosystems has been rather vast. And that's why when we think of the solutions, and of course the North plays a big role in carbon sequestration and also being the home of many traditional and indigenous communities, um, we have to think of new ways and also approaches of what to do. And what we call rewilding essentially contains an early start on restoration. What it really means is that we'll, we might go in and help an ecosystem to start to recover, but then, then there's an exit point. So we'll we'll just let nature take its course and trust also that the true rewilding, as we call it, or the northern rewilding, these uh, natural cycles and succession of land will start to heal itself. Can you tell us some of the basics about the landscape rewilding program? Like when was it founded? How many areas are you working in? How much land do you have under restoration? For a couple, a couple of those reasons, which I was talking about earlier, like how the Finnish boreal and the peatlands and the forests have been essentially lost or they have become um, economic lands. We have to think of new solutions, especially, especially now under climate change, that will actually restore and bring back a lot of the functions of a uh, relevant landscape. So maybe four years ago, we started to have a conversation with European entities like the European Investment Bank to think, how can we move fast? We know that 2030 is soon here, and that's often slated to be the year when we have to be in a much better place in terms of soil-based emissions for climate, tackling the biodiversity crisis, meaning the Anthropocene and the sixth extinction event and the wave, and so on and so on. And we came up with a model called landscape rewilding, which is a very cost-effective way to try to bring large landscapes back into health, meaning that while they may have faced de degradation in the past, the saving grace of the boreal or the northern forest is that, unlike the Amazonia, it can make a comeback even in a few decades. So then we started this work maybe four years ago on pilot areas and subsequently fast expanded on both uh, lands that Snow Change, which is the nonprofit uh, driving this program, purchased for the villages and communities. So there's a strong social element here of trying to return lands back to these villages. And secondly, we are putting in place a land concession program. So what it means in practice is that we are working with private landowners or the state to say, look, can you join this historic mission for the North and will you allow us to do our good work using indigenous knowledge and science to rewild these habitats and we'll, we'll have a written agreement on, on the uses of the land, even though we don't physically always have to buy, buy these lands. And the logic behind the land purchases is that there is no land rights as such for the indigenous or local communities in Finland. 
there's an there's a private land competition that can be filled with money company or timber company or any other entity as such so to to this date we have been able to uh influence positively about 26000 hectares over six catchment areas of major rivers in Finland and um, we also own about a bit less than 2000 hectares which is for a small country quite considerable amount of land but those purchased lands which we are restoring and rewilding are uh, strategically positioned so that while we purchase maybe 300 hectares it can then influence downstream a much larger area of a river system or a lake or forest or whatever they and we can also create these ecological corridors between two core areas so that's the logic behind and the numbers of what's going on right now can you describe for us the activities that you do when you go into an area to rewild it well all of our sites are essentially having a or they are on our third life so to speak so what i mean by that is that back in the day there was ice age that uh, formed of course these natural systems then at some point in time there was a human influence degradation maybe a mine or clear cut or whatever the case might might have been for the um, de- destruction of the original habitat and now comes rewilding with the idea that these uh, lo- so-called lost lands or uh, damaged lands still contain a huge potential for for the planet, for biodiversity, and for carbon sequestration. What we have to consider when we are working on a site is how how bad the damages are. Sometimes it's a moonscape, and that implies that in the early years, maybe between one and four years, we have to use caterpillars, diggers, and careful planning on restarting of natural cycles. For example, the carbon sequestration or keeping soil-based emissions on the ground by creating a wetland. So we have made huge amounts of wetlands, uh, ranging from a few acres into hundreds of acres, uh, depending on the case. And the question we always have to ask is, what can we do? We can't say that we are bringing back original pristine nature. That's not the case. These are sites which have sometimes undergone a tremendous intensive land use by human society. So then, of course, we try to see what will happen. And the exciting rewilding action is that, or the result of these rewilding actions is that nature have, has, in many cases and many sites, come in by storm. And there's one area where we had two bird species before we started, and now it's the home of 195 bird species, including very rare wader birds, some of them have never been seen in Finland before, and also in quantity with 20-30 thousand geese that can utilize these wetlands on their uh, migrations. We have partnered also with the U.S.-led rewilding process on the northwestern corner of the U.S. I'll just say in, in a sentence about that, so maybe that will give you a better context where in, in the Olympic Peninsula in the Washington state, there was a river system or there is a river system called the Elwa, E-L-W-H-A. And there was two hydro stations, hydro dam stations or hydropower stations on that river for almost a hundred years. And through a number of incredible steps and large actions, both of those dams were taken down maybe a decade ago. And now there was large reservoir or essentially an artificial lake that has been now um, drained out and the river is of course back on its course on this reservoir. And there in comes the question, what do we call these habitats that are now being rewilded and nurtured back into a natural cycle? That's that's not an easy question to answer. And in some ways you... uh, I sometimes think that our sites are on their kind of third life, that they they have been given a new chance or at least uh, they are recovering to a certain extent. So a lot of our program has to do with destroyed, degraded lands, trying to nurture them back into health, as well as keeping ecological core areas, of course, intact. Rewilding can never replace conservation of pristine or high, val- high cons- conservation value 
areas, of course, but it can be complementing and uh, supporting over landscapes, new kind of a start for many, many actions. Uh, I think Sir David Attenborough was saying recently that rewilding may be the only capacity we have left on scale to bring the planet back into health, given that there's no more land being made. We had you on this podcast back in 2018, and we discussed how traditional indigenous knowledge can inform climate science. So our listeners can certainly go back and find that episode. But just to recap a bit, will you tell us a bit about why science and indigenous communities knowledge are both so important to the rewilding program? Yeah, um, well, of course, the current mess where we are in the planetary crisis, the COVID and and you name it, what's out there, Anthropocene, loss of species, acidification of the oceans. A lot of these are, of course, the result of not paying attention and being wise. Wise in caretaking the commons, better improvement of natural resources, extraction, and so on and so on. And that's in that's where indigenous knowledge by indigenous peoples uh, often and and alongside local communities as well, they are equally important, um, may provide extremely important aspects of how, how do we do things better? How do we improve? Science ultimately is only a tool. We can have the metrics on how much carbon there is in the atmosphere. We can have temperature data all across the planet. It It can convey the urgency, but science as such is only a tool for the most part. And in many cases, scientific ethics are also lacking behind uh, decades on things like cloning issues or what do we do in the ethical treat- treatment of animals or whatever the case might be. And that's why the indigenous, if I if I just summarize it using indigenous knowledge in our member communities and partner communities, we try to have based of the both worlds where the latest science, for example, on rewilding and recreation of carbon sinks and carbon capture soils meets with indigenous wisdom. And the concept here is that the um, traditional owners or the indigenous caretakers of their homelands have often also baseline information on how things used to be. And if we are trying to rewild and bring back into health these habitats, and especially in the north and in the high Arctic, there's scarce scientific data on how things used to be. And therefore, the observations and knowledge of indigenous peoples may be in a crucial um, point or a source of information, as well as providing the um, good way of doing things, moral way of doing things. They, After all, 80% of planets remaining biodiversity, one way or the other, according to peer-reviewed science, is in the indigenous homelands. So clearly they have been do, do, doing something better than than the industrial society as such. Uh, just to give you a very practical one-line example, um, if you think of the western coast of the U.S. and the large salmon rivers that used to be there, like Columbia, Snake, and all those other big systems, nobody actually knows how much salmon used to be there when those systems were in a natural state. And only by carefully exploring the oral histories and indigenous knowledge of those those peoples on that coast, for example, we might get the pre-industrial levels of, of a habitat or a species or baseline information on how things even used to be. And I think that's a, that's a valid uh, example of portraying how we are losing habitats, species, critically important um, planetary systems by our land use and creed, even before realizing what was there. There are many species that have never been discovered in the rainforests before they were burned down. And uh, that's that's kind of the complex uh, summary of why indigenous knowledge matters. It It's not a some abstract and far away stream of information. It's actually about here uh, it's embedded in those ecosystems. It's often narrated and guided and, and uh, conveyed based by those indigenous knowledge holders that are living in in, in a specific place. Of course, the, to conclude, the classical example would be the 
indigenous Australians who have oral histories of a sea level change that go, goes back 40,000 years, as was demonstrated by Patrick Nunn, my colleague from Australia, uh, a couple of years ago. So if we are able to bring these ver- varied knowledge systems into a dialogue, a very powerful understanding of what we need to do may emerge if it's a respectful and mindful dialogue between science and indigenous knowledge. With regard to the projects the Landscape Rewilding program takes on, obviously the rewilding or restoration component is the core of the project, but it seems safe to say that creating the conditions for indigenous or local communities to thrive once again in those areas is also core to the program, no? Well, um, thank you. That's smack on, Mike. And um, again, for those listeners that have, have not been perhaps able to investigate what's going on in Finland or Sweden or Northwest Russia. Um, These are countries where there's no tribal rights or indigenous rights or community rights, despite the fact that much the same kind of land grabbing and colonial processes have taken place in this part of the world too. And that's why in the Landscape Rewilding Program, we have tried to put in place a very strong rights-based view. Many of our sites have become what's known as indigenous and community conserved areas under the United Nations, ICCAs. And that's coming on an understanding that even even the conservation actions like protection of nature or conservation of nature in the past happened from a power position. If you think of the classical big parks in Africa, Serengeti, Maasai Mara and those Uh, that were created by the British colonial government, they drove away the traditional owners of those parks, which was, of course, the Maasai people. Or if you think of in the US, uh, the most first park that was ever created, the Yellowstone, this used to be the the home area and and, uh, had been taken care of by the Shoshone and Blackfeet and other indigenous peoples of that area centuries before there even was something called the US. And um, that's why conservation in this decade and this century also has to happen in new ways. And if you look at the things that happen in the Landscape Rewilding Program, it brings self-esteem. Well, first of all, it brings jobs to highly marginalized communities in the Arctic and in the North. So it's a very uh, important economic incentive. Secondly, there are steps that bring self-esteem, pride, and and, uh, a feeling that a remote community or marginalized community or peoples can actually influence the what's going on in the world. It's not an easy thing to look outside the window or listen to, to the news and hear about Trump, about Biden, about oil and gas, about climate catastrophe, about war in Syria or Navalny or whatever the case might be, and and then think, what are we to do when we are faced with already degraded landscapes and quite important climate change events. So that's why there has been a very exciting element to the program where the communities are, at least what I have seen, um, are enjoying the ranger programs. They are seeing pride in their knowledge and collaboration with scientists in, in ways that manifest also their rights. And one of the mechanisms that has been super exciting has been this ICCA or Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas under the UN uh, because it's in a way giving a, um, for the lack of better term, it's giving a, a validation on the UN level to the kind of conservation work that goes into new places and embraces also the Indigenous governance and rights and, and uh, land uses. You've mentioned the carbon sequestration potential of the areas you're working in. When you go into a new area, do you have carbon sequestration targets in mind, or is that more of a happy byproduct of your work? Mike, that's one of the most fundamental questions, and I'm very happy you, you brought it up in the sense that the northern peatlands or these northern ecosystems that are in Alaska, Canada, Finland, and so on, are actually having more carbon in the soil, and they also they can be active sinks, meaning storing new carbon from the atmosphere. And there's a growing push by the markets to enter into arrangements like carbon credits or other financial mechanisms to pay and or 
purchase these compensation rights. So we have been approached even by oil companies saying, can we finance your work so that we can alleviate and compensate our businesses? And of course, Snow Change, the organization that's running the Landscape Rewilding Program, we have tried to review and discuss it internally quite heavily. And ultimately, we have just said to the whole uh, range of partners uh, or people that have come to us and companies that, look, we are doing it for the planet and the communities, and we will calculate the exact carbon tally or the car- greenhouse gas, methane and carbon dioxide um, inventories on our sites. And some of them are very powerful sites. We have, for example, uh, in a year, one million kilos that are saved on one specific site to just name one out of many, many, many more. Plus the, all the carbon that's kept on the ground in the peat soils. But then we have not mo- uh, put it into a monetization or monetary value. It's just for the planet and for the action on climate change. And we are using these very fancy trace gas analyzers, one of the first ones ever to be put in use in the field. They look like a Ghostbusters film backpack with a <laughs> ray gun, but uh, they are actually be, you can use them to calculate the exact carbon tally on per hectare. But uh, we are just doing it to keep track of how we are succeeding on the rewilding work as nature takes over again. We are not monetizing it and we will, going going back to those ideas of values and wisdom, we, we think that mo- you shouldn't put money and monetary value on a lot of these community lands. They are just there for the whole benefit of humanity and of course these uh, indigenous and traditional communities that are embedded in those habitats. I was hoping you could tell us about a specific project. Last year, you announced you were going to be rewilding the Koitayoki River Basin. Can you tell us about that project? A lot of the areas in the north are especially populated. And if you think of Alaska and other North American northern locations, northern Minnesota, Ontario, and all the way to Northwest Territories. And one of the things that's complex is the large scale of these areas, these river systems no matter if they are here or there. So in this Koitajoki system that we have here on the Finnish-Russian border, we, we have now spent roughly six months in trying to take that pulse of a large system. It's about 6,500 square kilometers of a basin. We know, of course, some of the big drivers. There's a hydrostation dam that prevents unique Atlantic salmon from coming in. Um, the, there is there has been a large ditching program and timber harvests, so we know where the, some of the damaged soils are. Mercury is leaching into the river and so on and so on. So there are some headlines level things we know, but then by going deep and investigating using multiple ways, including this indigenous knowledge, we do believe that we are in, in a process to, by the end of the year, come to a place where we know, for the lack of a better term, the pulse of the system for the first time. And, and also including what's going on with methane, carbon dioxide, and how does it travel within the water system and so on. And and um, Koitajoki matters on the international scale uh, for a couple of reasons. It's the home of the uh, our Karelian oral histories and songs that inspired J.R.R. Tolkien to make his elven languages for the Lord of the Rings and also Longfellow for his Song of Hiawatha. So the traditional knowledge that's embedded in these villages is of immense value. It's been there. It's a UNESCO level river system that would deserve a UNESCO World Heritage status and maybe one day it will because of these actions. But the here in the European North, it's kind of a symbolically valuable both on the human culture and natural values. And now, now that we are in this amazing new century where, on the other hand, you have mind-numbing damages to the planet and then completely new solutions like the dialogue between indigenous knowledge and latest science, it's tremendously exciting to be at the threshold of seeing the potential of how much we can do if we have a little bit of resources, 
ultimately this is the whole rewilding is not a money issue at all we could rewild essentially vast landscapes across continents with not too much money um, but it's also the transformation of how things can happen in nature conservation and in society because essentially it's a promise it's no longer that duality of land use where you are either maximizing the extraction of, of land and resources mining water gold whatever the case or you are creating these static uh, conservation areas like na national parks which are of course important in their own right it's like a third wave a, a third way where you are able to nurture habitats back into life and somehow it feels that nature herself is also trusting that work if we didn't have the critical evidence from biological limnological and other sciences i wouldn't say that but uh, we do we have seen tremendous comebacks in areas that we never believed would be possible in terms of for example number number of birds uh, including very rare species and it seems that there's a great uh, potential here for having more time, more space and more uh, landscapes for nature to take over and coexist with humans. And then it then it's no longer a thrival issue. If we can export and extrapolate this model, for example, in the continental US, across Europe, uh, uh, across large areas that are currently on single soil or monoculture habitats for one single purpose we might have a fighting chance that's the most exciting part because we have all the data on how bad we are doing and how bad the urgency is on climate biodiversity and all these other fires are so ultimately looking at koitayoki and seeing how the villages are responding to this new time the excitement by the school children as they are looking at fisheries and um, uh, relearning about species, seeing how the old people are realizing that their knowledge has value in a society that has been so, you know, in a way, atomic. That um, at least in the Western countries, old people's knowledge doesn't really car carry a lot of uh, way. And then, of course, ultimately, the physical comeback of species, restart of carbon trapping or sequestration, and on and on and on. Those are the kind of the most mo motivating things uh, in scale you can witness. And that's why we are strong proponents of this approach, because we, we feel that herein lies also not only for some remote northern areas, but over national landscapes, a uh, lot of promise that could, could happen on a very cost-effective manner. If you enjoy the Mangabe Newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. So if you have a friend or a family member who's particularly interested in ecological restoration, this is the perfect episode to send to them. Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Mangabe. Mangabe is a non-profit news outlet, so just a dollar or more per month would really help us with offsetting production costs and hosting fees. Supporters at the $10 a month level also get access to our members-only insider content. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash mangabe to learn more and support the Mangabe newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash mangabe. You and your friend could subscribe to the Manga Bay Newscast wherever you get your podcasts from, or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can read all of Manga Bay's news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash mangabay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at mangabay on both of those platforms. Thanks, as always, for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.